traditionally you, in order to, you know, get this, uh, you know, 1.8 meg, you were spending another 260, yes. 60 yes. odd megabytes just to do that. <laughs> That's right. Hey there, welcome to Embedded Toolbox, the video interview series where we try to save the world by solving one engineering challenge at a time. And something that's uh, occurring in the electronics industry more and more is that developers are trying to deploy uh, their applications, their code onto embedded devices, but a lot of those developers aren't very well versed in traditional embedded programming languages like C. Um, they want to use something that's a higher level language, it's more abstracted, uh, things like Python, or in this case, today, uh, Java. I mean, Java is a very popular language all across the development world, um, but it's not particularly designed to be deployed onto embedded systems. So in order to help us wade through this uh, new world where we've got these higher level developers trying to work with these lower level systems, we brought on Simon Ritter, who's the deputy CTO of Azul Systems. How are you doing, Simon? I am doing very well, thank you. Very good. So uh, what say you? What do you see happening in the marketplace? Java is a managed runtime environment, and that makes it ideal for this kind of um, application because, you know, simple things like memory management, you don't have to worry about that. You get the space allocated for you by the JVM. The JVM cleans up after you. So all those things where you get memory leaks, especially in embedded applications, which is something that's really nasty, um, all of that kind of thing is taken away from you. Clearly, you can still do memory leaks if you forget to, like, lose your links to things but uh, you know in terms of the basic ideas it's a much better idea for that and the fact that lots and lots of people know how to program in java it's you know you once you've learned how to program in java then writing embedded code is just the same as writing other application code um, you use some nice sets of libraries i'm going to show you one a little bit called pi for j which just makes that abstraction away from all the gpio stuff and i squared c really really simple so things like that make java a very powerful platform for writing applications but of course like i mentioned up at the top uh it is a little bit more bloated than your traditional embedded code right and then that's a problem what are we looking at in terms of the memory footprint footprint of a typical java runtime that's right. I mean, one of the things that Java is now 25 years old. And what we've seen <laughs> is that if you go all the way back to JDK 1.0, you know, there were, and I actually looked this up, there were 211 classes th that you could use to develop your application. You move forward to JDK 11, and you've got over 8,500 classes that you can use to develop an application. But nobody's going to use all of those classes in one application. So what we need is a way of kind of stripping down to the, the basics of what we require. And that's, that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of using um, the things that we've done today. Great. So um, we're going to hop in and, and we're going to be uh, using uh, Azul Systems Zulu 11. Can you tell us uh, really quickly uh, while we switch over to the uh, application you've got ready, what Zulu 11 is all about and you know how it's beneficial in this context? Sure. Um, I mean, the thing with, with Zulu 11 is what we've done is we've taken the OpenJDK source code and that's the source code of Java, the open source project. And so we then build it for different embedded platforms and embedded is a bit well, is very different to <laughs> desktop applications because you know desktop applications you know it's an intel processor you're running windows you're running linux you're running mac if it's a server you're running linux you're running windows and again it's an intel processor or amd so it's very easy to to just build a binary for that embedded systems a little bit more complicated because you've got lots of different chip architectures lots of different fiddly details so we can produce tailored runtimes for whatever the customer wants in terms of that particular runtime so what i'm using today is, is a raspberry pi so it's an arm processor um, we support other things like PowerPC, MIPS, all of the kind of typical embedded architectures. Can we take a look at your setup? Yeah, so, so what I've got here is a simple setup where I've got a Raspberry Pi that you can see here, and I've connected a couple of simple peripherals to it. I've got an accelerometer that's using an I squared C interface, and then I've just got a simple switch that's using the GPIO pins to pull it high or pull it low, and then we should be able to pick up that change across the pins and, and be able to do something with it. So that's then connected, everything's kind of happily running. 
obviously what I want to be able to do is to develop my application code in a simplest way because I don't really want to have to do it on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, right. It's you know, rather complicated and can be a bit messy. Just, just to be clear, you don't have some uh, external, external memory you're hiding off of that, <laughs> off of that Raspberry no, Pi or anything? No, no. Okay. I'm just using a, a very standard Raspberry Pi there. Um, so the first thing is if I show you what I've done is I'm using NetBeans. I, I will admit I'm one of the few people who still uses NetBeans as my development IDE, but I could use any other, I could use Eclipse, I could use IntelliJ, it doesn't make any difference. I just happen to like NetBeans. Um, what I've done is I've created this simple application which is gonna interact with a database. So I've got some JDBC, MySQL, SQL kind of interaction going on. And then I've got the GPIO side of things for the switch and I've got some I squared C things for the idea of connecting to the accelerometer. Right. Now, in terms of the JDBC driver, that's just a normal Java library. So once I've decided which database I want to use, I don't have to do anything terribly exciting. I just load the library I need and that's it. And for the interacting with the peripherals, what I've used there is this thing called Pi4J. Open source project, really, really good because it abstracts away all of that low level stuff where you need to do, you know, peek and poke and like <laughs> all, all the really kind of low level things into a nice Java library where I can literally say, okay, I want a GPIO pin. It's that number pin. I want to be able to listen to what's coming on that pin, whether it goes high, whether it goes low. I can set up an I squared C interface and just read things from that, send commands to the I squared C. And again, as a Java developer, I don't need to worry about any of the details of that. It's just like, this is the message I want to send, let the library deal with the complexity of it. Makes developing code really, really easy in that respect. That's awesome. So I build the code and then all I do is, because it's a Raspberry Pi, I've set it up with a simple um, Samba server so that I can copy files across directly. I won't show you that because well, copying a file is not very exciting. So, so here I am on my Raspberry Pi. And so what I've done is, I, as I said, I've, I've copied the, the files over. But the important thing to look at first is if we go to the opt directory, um, in here I've got my Zulu 11 installation. So this is the full JDK that you get for the Zulu 11. And if I do the U minus SH on Zulu 11, what we'll see is that is 269 megabytes in size. Whoa, way too much. <laughs> Pretty big, yeah, especially when we're dealing with embedded devices, 269 megabytes just for the Java runtime seems a little heavy. And the reason for that is, as I say, there's, there's thousands of libraries that are included in there. And because we're only doing database access because we're only doing GPIO stuff. We don't need all of that stuff. We don't need a desktop. We don't need XML parsing or anything like that. So what we want to do is get rid of all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And one of the really nice things in Zulu 11 is that now we have a module system in the Java runtime. And the module system has basically taken all these thousands of libraries and divided up into 75 modules. And then what we can do is we can select which modules we want to build our runtime. Now, again, if we look at the application which we've got, I've got a jar file that contains all the things I need. Now, if I look at the size of that, uh, then that's just 12K, so very small application. There are some libraries, um, so let's just uh, do libraries. So there's 1.7 megs in libraries. Okay. Um, again, so, 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 um, traditionally you, in order to, you know, get this, uh, you know, 1.8 meg, you were spending another 260, yes. <laughs> 60 yes. odd megabytes just to do that. <laughs> That's right. And in fact, I could probably reduce the libraries a bit further cause I, I haven't stripped them down, but I could probably minimize them a bit further as well. Um, so obviously what we've got here is, is some small code and a very big runtime. How do we get that runtime to be smaller? Well, there's a really useful command that comes with Zulu 11 now, which is called JDEPS. And so if I do JDEPS, um, what I can do is, the first one I can do is, is list dependencies. And what that's going to do is it's going to figure out what modules from the Java runtime are actually needed for my PyTest. test. Mm -hmm. If I run that, what I'll see is it comes back and it says java.base, java.logging, java.sql. So essentially the things I need are java.base, which is everybody needs that. It's right. kind of the most basic things in Java, like string and thread and all that kind of stuff. So you can't get away from that. But then I'm doing some logging and I'm doing some database access. 
So these are the things I need. So you're saying, Simon, that that um, what you've done in Zulu 11 is compress everything inside um, of a traditional Java runtime down into 76 uh, modules. And here, we're, we've limited that even down just to three. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's the basic idea is that we're, we're split it up into 75, 76 modules. And now we know that for this application, we only need these three. And so again, if I just do JDEPS again, um, but this time I'll use it with the print module dependencies flag, that gives me a slightly different output. And the reason for that is that this is designed to be as, used as input to another command. Mm -hmm. But we can see here that we just need Java base and Java.sql. Now, because Java base is needed by everybody, we can ignore that because it will always include that. So literally all we're interested in is Java.sql. So now what I can do, is I can say, okay, let's use a different command, again, that comes with Zulu 11, which is called jlink. And so if I do jlink here, what I'll see is the command that I've set up. And what this is going to do is it's going to build a new runtime for me. So it's going to take the JDK that I've got installed. It's going to copy bits of that that I need into another directory so that I can still run my application from there. So if we look at the command flying flags we've got here, we've got jlink. Um, first thing I'm going to do is say, I don't want any header files because I'm not going to compile anything, so I don't care about those. Certainly don't need any manual pages. Strip those out. Um, there's some compression options so that you can actually compress some of the files even further. I've used the number two there, which is the maximum level of compression you can get. Um, strip out the debug information because my application works. Don't need to debug it. And then... <laughs> The modules that I want to add are just the Java.sql module. So I'm just interested in that one. And then lastly, where I want to put the, the runtime that I built. So slash opt slash runtime. And if I run that, that takes a few seconds to run. And there we go. So that's run the jlink command. And now if I go back to slash opt, we'll find that I've got a runtime in there. And if I now do... I'll just remind everybody, so du minus sh on Zulu 11, which is the full JDK. So then remember, that's 269 megabytes, really big. Right. If we do the same thing on runtime that we've just built, we get 29 megabytes. Holy cow. <laughs> a big difference. So there's literally an order of magnitude, 10% of the size that we had before. That's... So we Obviously. just you just took a machete basically to to the traditional Java runtime, but we've got to make sure that this actually works. There's no there's no uh, vaporware here, right, Simon? That's correct. <laughs> so exactly. So what we need to do is we need to make sure that this will still work. So if I go back to my directory where I've got my code, what I'm going to do now is first thing I'll do I'll just show you that. Um, so if I do slash op slash runtime slash bin Java minus version just to show you that it does work so okay that's version 11.06 good okay so that's all right um next thing i can do is i can actually show you what modules are included in there so if we run with the list modules what we'll see is actually we've got five modules and the reason we've got five modules rather than one or two modules is because jlink will analyze all the dependencies that are required so Java.sql actually needs Java.xml and it needs Java.logging to do some uh, bits of what JDBC does. And all of that's handled by us handled by JLink automatically. We don't need to worry about that. But it still comes down to that nice 29 megabytes in size. And so just to, to prove that the application will work with my reduced runtime, what we can do now is we can do run the application. So we'll do minus jar on PyTest. And if we run that, that will start running. Now it's connected to the database. It's read a whole bunch of information that I stored in it previously when I ran the application a few times. And then it's set up and it's listening for the switch to be pressed. So if I now switch press the switch times, on my system here, what we can yeah. see is we've got a couple of events going on. And there we go. And it's written some date records to the database. So just to prove that the application does in fact work. Um, and so if you wanted to really prove that it works, uh, we've got 19 records there. What I'll do is I'll stop that, I'll run it again. And there we go, we've got 27 records in there. So it definitely did store some stuff in the database for us. So everything worked. 
Wow, that's fantastic. That's really impressive, Simon. I mean, for the entire world of, of Java programmers um, that are being asked to, you know, whether it's an IoT context or otherwise, that are being asked to deploy their applications down onto an embedded system that has you know, constraints in, ter in terms of memory, um, you can go ahead and develop your entire application on a desktop, right? And then just use Zulu 11 uh, to pare it down all the way, you know, depending on what your application needs, but pare it down significantly to fit inside of that small footprint. That's right, absolutely. It really is a major advantage over how we used to do things in the past, because as I say, the, the fact that we can now select which bits we need and not have to deploy the whole thing really makes it a lot better for an embedded type application. Um, is there anywhere uh, that people can go and maybe do a little bit of a trial on, on Zulu 11? Absolutely. If you go to our website, azul.com, and then we have what's called Zulu Community. And the thing about that is it's, it's a free distribution of Zulu. And that includes all the different ones that people might want. So it's got the Intel versions, it's got the server versions, but it also has the embedded ones for ARM processors. So if you're doing something like the Raspberry Pi, then you can get a free version. Good enough to get your feet wet, right? Absolutely, yeah. You can definitely experiment with it. You can try it out, um, develop your code, and see how it get everything working. Very good. Well, I want to thank you so much, Simon. Uh, this is really exciting stuff. And I know that a lot of members of the development community, um, if they weren't aware that this type of solution was available before, uh, they are probably very happy to hear that they can continue uh, working with Java and not have to get involved in all that messy <laughs> low-level embedded code. Uh, so thank, thanks for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you very much.